Andy and James work with our with the organization I always call Tenris. It's our natural resources group, and they it's kind of control central for all things mapping for the state, really, isn't it? That's what I always think of it as. And both have been uh, huge advocates for all kinds of open source mapping. And we had a, a terrific conversation a few weeks ago, and you were and, and they were telling me a little bit about what's going on internationally with some op with open source mapping and thought it would be fun to actually do kind of a lab, lab demonstration with using some open source mapping. I'm James Seppi, I'm a software developer at Tinder, as Sharon said. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, this presentation is viewable at this URL if you want to follow along on your computer. Ahead. I kind of linger on the slide too much or something. Um, it's, it's helpful because there's some links in there for the exercise later, so you might want to bring it up. Uh, let's see, I'm also an organizer of MapTime ATX. MapTime is like this kind of this kind of phenomenon that started a couple years ago where some people in San Francisco wanted to learn about how to do web mapping and what a web map was and the technology behind it, and so they just decided to set some time aside once a week and learn with each other, and they kind of shared that idea with other people, and their group grew, and eventually started spreading internationally now. Um, so Andy and I are the organizers of the Austin chapter of MapTime. We also help kind of organize the Austin Open Source Geospatial Meetup Group, or GIS Meetup Group, um, which is kind of a user group for people who use open source GIS software, like QGIS or Leaflet or a bunch of other different technologies. So what is an online map? Uh, first of all, does anybody here have experience doing anything? Like Google, I'm sure everybody's used Google Maps for directions at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's sure. the example. Um, has anybody like made? Because Google's got like kind of a creator where you can go like at maybe some restaurants or some friends in town or something. So what's a web map? It's typically streets or uh, this example is satellite imagery from Bing um, with streets overlaid. Uh, sometimes you've got a simplified background map called a base map and some data on top. Uh, this is one from the Texas Tribune that shows current reservoir levels in Texas. Uh, Andy's the one who actually made the app that, that provides the data for this uh, news application. And you've probably seen a lot of maps, uh, if you read the New York Times at all, they're really big into showing data on a map. Uh, NPR also does a lot of uh, news reports with maps involved. Um, and they're found everywhere, like I said, news sites, food review sites, travel sites, data explorers. There's Yelp, um, Airbnb, uh, Eater. This is an article if you guys are uh, from out of town and want to find some, <laughs> some good tacos in town. Uh, and this is an app that Andy and I made at our jobs that uh, shows state water planning data in a map interface. Maps show borders. They show where people go. They show where people want to go. Um, they can kind of illustrate what policies are doing, how people are voting. Um, where earthquakes are, all kinds of natural phenomena. Here's an example that's kind of famous. I don't know if you've, if you've seen this at all, but uh, when the Russia Crimea stuff happened, Google actually changed their map to show up differently. In the US version of Google Maps, there's a dotted line. On the Russian version of the maps, there's a strong, solid borderline. And on the Ukraine, there is no line. This is a really good book called How to Lie with Maps. Uh, it's pretty old, actually. Um, but it is a, it's a really solid book. A lot of cartographers have read it, and it informs a lot of uh, a lot of how we think about making maps now. A little history about web maps. Um, MapQuest was kind of the first online map uh, in 1996. So that was a long time ago. I don't think I was on the internet back then. It had driving directions. It was on the internet, and you could print, and you could find points of interest like auto shops and all kinds of stuff. And so that that was a huge deal at the time. Um, but it was slow. Of course, everything on the internet was slow at that time. There's a few turns. Uh, you had to kind of you had to click, and the whole page would refresh uh, if you wanted to zoom in or if you wanted to move to the left or to the right. Uh, and it stayed that way for a long time. It was uh, nine years. And there's the original Google Maps where you could zoom around and pan the map, and the page didn't refresh. Uh, you could just fluidly scroll and also get directions, and that kind of that really opened up the world of web mapping. 
but I, I've heard recently that the autonomous driving vehicles is putting more, uh, is highlighting the role of maps, because cars without people driving them will be dependent on really good maps. Oh, of course, and you can imagine like mapping the entire world is, is a huge, crazy undertaking. There are so many roads. Uh, just in the U.S. alone, it's kind of a, kind of boggling to, to think about how many how many roads there are, um, and they're going all over and taking pictures all over the place. The so tiles are little 256 by 256 pixel images, uh, and when they are next to each other, they form what looks like a, a large continuous image. Um, and the reasons for that are because of the way web browsers and the internet works. It takes a long time to load one large image the size of your screen. But if you're loading a bunch of ones, it kind of appears to you that everything's happening very smoothly and instantaneously, uh, instead of like waiting 30 seconds for one large image to come in. This is what Andy and I look like down in our office <laughs> when we're hard at work here in Texas. <laughs> Credit is used for making visualizations on maps, um, and it's all built on open source technology, which is pretty cool. So they're kind of standing on the shoulders of giants in building this product. Um, PostgreSQL is a really popular open source database, and PostGIS is an extension for that that allows it to store geospatial data types, uh, like points, lines, and polygons. Uh, it can do lots of pauses, like finding where if a point is inside of a polygon or if two polygons intersect. Um, it's really good at doing those operations. Uh, PrioDB is super cool because you can just drag and drop a bunch of different types of data, either from a spreadsheet, uh, or KML, which was Google's, it was a startup that they bought a long time ago, but that's kind of a de facto web standard for geospatial data, or shapefiles. Do you have any questions based on web maps or anything? Is that interesting? <laughs> We're gonna try some other mapping uh, endeavors. <laughs> yep, uh, so hi everyone, um, I'm Andy, talking about what OpenStreetMap is. Um, so a good analogy, is that OpenStreetMap is like the Wikipedia of maps. It's, um, it's a map of the planet uh, that's global in scope. Every place on, on Earth can be put in OpenStreetMap. And uh, we'll come back to this a little bit later, but this is a big deal, uh, especially in developing countries where uh, high quality digital maps don't yet exist. Yeah, so it's free to edit, anybody can edit it. Um, and, and that means if you see errors in the map, then you can fix them. And, um, like we were talking about before with the favelas, if, um, if you're not on the map, um, people can put themselves on the map, and so you don't have to have permission from a company or a government to do that. Applies the principles of open source and open data uh, for, for humanitarian response and economic development. So what they do is they interface between open street mappers and the kind of established humanitarian institutions like uh, the World Bank, the UN, uh, Red Cross, and uh, Doctors Without Borders, and and they um, they kind of take OpenStreetMap data and these humanitarian efforts and make sure that they're kind of working work together. So what does that look like? Um, this is like really good graphic. I think that kind of tells a story. Um, so step one: remote volunteers fill fill in the map by tracing high-resolution imagery that's been donated by companies and governments. Uh, step two: the details get filled in by people on the ground. Um, and then step three is that the humanitarian organizations can then use those maps to do their work. Um, this graphic is from the Missing Maps Project, which focuses on uh, non-crisis mapping, so more for economic development and just kind of getting a map. This is a visualization uh, that Maplox uh, made, um, and it shows the first three days of edits in uh, Nepal following the earthquake on April 25th. So the, the initial focus after a disaster like that is to map road networks um, because connectivity is incredibly important for the, for the relief efforts. Um, and it's also very easy to do by just kind of tracing uh, aerial imagery. How does uh, OpenStreetMap actually represent the world? So nodes, these are points. Uh, they represent points of interest, um, like businesses, churches, bus stops, stoplights, things that uh, lines are used to represent are these. Um, Here's some polygon examples. You can put anything in as a key and anything in, a, in as a value, but part of uh, learning OpenStreetMap is learning about which conventions are used. Uh, I tried to pick a place that would be kind of familiar, uh, and this is, how do you say that? Commercial. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
So you already know about it. Um, my understanding is there used to be a palace here, uh, and then it was destroyed in the mid 18th century, and they felt bad for the king, so they made a statue of him and they put it in the middle. <laughs> is that about right? <laughs> here's, an, here's a good example of relations. So these are different plus reps that mm -hmm. operate on that specific same thing. Assuming they're up to date, um, that's not always the case, but if you know people are maintaining that, then, then that would be true. The editing and, and your analogy to Wikipedia really brings up the question of how, how are data vetted in this? You know, Wikipedia has a whole process for evaluating the goodness of what people submit to it. What's the process here? Um, so, uh, I actually am not super familiar with it. So, the, I, think the, I think the process is the idea is that if you have a lot of people watching the map, that they'll be able to make the directions mm -hmm. and add stuff. Um, I think there, the sense I get is that people are starting to work on kind of those mm -hmm. Wikipedia-like tools. Cause, like, in Wikipedia, pages can be locked if there's contention and that sort of thing. So, uh, so that was what the map looks like. Um, so, so now we'll talk about how we can make edits to it. Um, so the first step is go to openstreetmap.org. Um, I guess maybe we can all just together. Uh, if kind of the workshop you 